Now think about the Ising model in two dimensions. I'm going to look at, so the Ising model is a, a random assignment of spins to the vertices of a graph. I'm going to look at two dimensional graphs and to simplify, I'm gonna look at uh, square grid, square lattice. So I will look at finite subset of the square grid and uh, more precisely, the framework I'm gonna take in this talk is going to look at uh, discretization by the square grid of planar domains, arbitrary planar domains. So you take uh, your favorite domain and you discretize it by uh, a square grid of mesh size delta. Delta is the size of a little square. So the Ising model is a random assignment of spins to the faces here of, of this graph. So we're gonna put plus or minus one spins on the faces of the graph. And the probability of a spin configuration is gonna be prescribed by its Boltzmann weight, exponential of minus beta times the energy. Where beta is a positive parameter, the inverse temperature, and H, the energy, is minus the sum over all pairs of adjacent faces of the product of the spins at this endpoint. So what you're effectively doing is uh, your probability of a spin configuration uh, will favor lower energy configurations. And uh, lower energy configurations are configurations for which there is local alignment of spins. For if two adjacent spins are the same, their contribution to the energy will be minus one. Well, if they are different, their contribution to the energy will be plus one. So you favor local alignment, and how much you favor local alignment is tuned by this parameter better. So this domain you took, you can view it as a window on a possibly larger system. And in order to make an analysis relevant, we uh, would like to put boundary conditions uh, on, great, thank you. Uh, you would like to prescribe a, the behavior of the spins on the boundary. So you can let them free, for instance. Or you can uh, impose plus boundary conditions. You can force the boundary spins to be plus one. Or minus boundary conditions, force them to be minus one. Or consider mixed boundary conditions. You would force a part of the boundary of the, uh, to be plus one and part of the boundary to be minus one, for instance. And all combinations of that. Okay, so that's the uh, model I wanna look at. And the question when you, when you do statistical mechanics is what happens as the system gets large in a language, what happens as the mesh size goes to zero. So let's just see pictures of what happens when the system gets large. So here are simulations of the easing model with various value of the parameter beta. So for beta small, say, what you see is a disordered picture. Here, the plus spins are drawn in blue and the minus spins are drawn in green. And uh, what you see is a, a noisy picture uh, with, uh, that looks really disordered at large scale, at least. Uh, while for beta large, you see a long range ferromagnetic order arise. Uh, what does it mean? It means that most spins tend to align in one direction. And so here I have prescribed plus boundary conditions, which makes uh, my spin uh, tends to be plus ones. Most of the time, or mo most of the spins will be plus one. What's gonna have happen is that the boundary spins have influenced their neighbors that have influenced their neighbors and so on and so forth. And you have this long range order. So this is a model for ferromagnetism in particular, and uh, this uh, you can think of the spins as um, as spins, so as a small magnetic dipole, and uh, that w uh, will take to simplify two directions. And uh, you ask a question: Do Does the local alignment effect that is present in your ferromagnetic material yield uh, a, a global alignment? Uh, yield a real magnet and it depends on the beta, it depends on the temperature. Okay, so this has been uh, made uh, precise and rig rigorous by Onzager. And uh, what was shown was that there was a phase transition at a special value of beta, such that below that value of beta, you see a disordered picture like that. And above that value of beta, you see a long range order like that. Possibly the simplest way of making this precise and quantitative at least the nicest, is to look at, say, large range uh, 
spin a correlation. So if you take two spins that are at positive distance, which means la uh, large range uh, as the mesh size goes to zero, uh, what you see is that if beta is beta greater than beta critical, the correlation will remain positive as the mesh size delta goes to zero. While if you're below or equal to beta critical, the correlation will tend to zero. Okay, so this is a result. This is a rephrasing of a result of Hans Eigenmann. And after this was discovered, uh, it started one of the most successful investigations in mathematical physics, uh, and uh, the people started using a easing model for many applications, and it also triggered uh, beautiful math development. Okay, so uh, today I want to speak mostly about what happens at very value of beta. What happens exactly here when the local interaction of the spins starts producing a long range alignment. Okay, so here is a picture of what it looks like. So it's something intermediate between this and that. You, you see a kind of fractal looking structure which looks very intriguing. And uh, for some reasons, this space, which is uh, describing uh, the phase transition, uh, has be, uh, remained, from a mathematical perspective, a bit less well understood than the other phase. Okay, so uh, what do we expect to see at the value of beta critical? You expect to see if you let the mesh size go to zero when beta is fixed, the value of beta critical, you expect to see a universal conformally invariant scaling limit. What does it mean? Universal means, uh, the easing model at critical temperature is expected to converge to an object which is independent of so-called irrelevant de details of the model, such as the lattice on which is it is defined. Uh, so you expect it to converge to a continuous object which forgets about the very, your very, the very choice of your lattice. For instance, if you were considering the easing model on the triangular lattice, the critical value of beta would be different yet the limit, what you would see in the limit, at that value of beta critical would be essentially the same as what you see uh, in the limit on the square lattice. And uh, you expect this limit to be more of a conformally invariant. What does it mean? It's a much stronger version uh, of uh, scale and rotational invariant. You expect scale invariant because you expect you have a scaling limit. So by definition, it should be scale invariant. You expect it to be universal, so you expect that it doesn't uh, depend on the way you discretize your domain, and as a result, it should be rotational invariant. But you expect, in two dimensions, to see more the, the very much stronger property of full conformal invariant. What does it mean? Well, here is a simple way to formulate it. So on any domain, you can discretize this domain by and consider the critical easing model on that domain and take a limit. and you obtain a continuous random object. And this continuous random object has conformal symmetry in the sense, in the following sense. Um, if a domain is the image of another domain by a conformal mapping, so a mapping that preserves angle, uh, then the uh, image of the easing model in the scaling limit on the first domain by the conformal mapping is the same as the continuous scaling limit of the easing model in that image domain. So uh, what does it mean the easing model is the same? We mean, if we want to for formulate things in a probabilistic language, we mean that the law of the continuous object underlying the easing model, if you take its image, it's the same as the law uh, of the continuous limit of easing model in this domain. Okay, so uh, to make the question precise and relevant, you have to explain what are you looking at. Okay, so uh, there are two types of natural objects you can look at. You look at uh, the description of the scaling limit of the easing model. You can look at the random fields that are relevant to describe the model and the relevant curves. So uh, the r r random fields of the easing model uh, are non-rigorously described uh, by conformal field theory. And the curves, the random curves that arise in the model uh, 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 should be described by uh, continuous random curves called SLE process. I'm going to speak about both 
uh, in a few minutes. Okay, so that's what you would like to do, and it happens that you can uh, carry uh, over this program for the easing model. So I should just mention that this picture you expect is rather universal in the sense that it should uh, it should work for other models as well. But I think there's no other model for which this scheme works as well as for the easing model. And uh, the goal of today is to explain why things work the way they do for easing models. What is the idea? The idea is that the lattice model you chose, this easing model, has some uh, magic property uh, that we are gonna use. So uh, Onzaga revealed that the two-dimensional easing model has some exact solvability in it. I'm gonna explain what it means, uh, at least in a language that we can use. So this exact solvability was recasted by many people in many different forms. And we're gonna use one formulation of exact solvability to identify what the scaling limits of the relevant uh, fields and curves are and uh, try to reveal some uh, emerging structures that will be consequence, say, of conformal invariance, universality, etc. Okay, any questions? Okay, so let me start by speaking about the fields of the easing model. Okay, so uh, you would like to describe, uh, you would like to find fields to describe an easing model configuration on lattice level. What is the most natural thing to do? Well, simply look at your random collection of plus minus one spin as a random field taking values plus or minus one. Okay, so uh, what you expect is that if you renormalize properly this random field taking values plus or minus one, you converge to a continuous field, a continuous random object. Okay, so this is uh, what you expect and this is what you have. So um, how are you gonna describe, describe your uh, continuous random field? Uh, there are different approaches. W I'm gonna take for today the approach of a uh, physicist, which is compute the analog of the moment. So compute the correlation function. So what are we doing? We're taking a finite number of points in our domain. We look at the field at this point on discrete level. So it could take plus or minus one values. And you look at the expectation. What you expect is that the spin field, once we normalize uh, by the mesh size delta, the size of a little square, to the power minus one over eight, it should converge to a continuous field. So if you look at n points, you renormalize by the mesh size to the power of minus n over eight. And as the mesh size goes to zero, you co should converge to something. And so the result uh, that I want to present with Ima Chalkak and uh, Konstantin Idiorov is the following, that indeed, if you renormalize the spin correlation by the proper uh, renormalization factor, as the mesh size goes to zero, you converge to a number that you can compute exactly, which is what? Which is a lattice dependent constant to the number of power of number of points. This is a non-universal part. It represents, it's the, what remains of the lattice, it's the square, times uh, a continuous universal object, a, a continuous formula uh, of the points and of the domain on which you look at the model. That is a conformally covariant tensor. So this conformal, uh, this uh, universal uh, quantity is uh, conformally covariant in the sense that if you uh, apply a conformal mapping to your domain, uh, the corresponding quantity, which is the limit of the uh, lattice model quantity, behaves as a conformally uh, covariant tensor of degree one over eight in each variable. Okay, so uh, this is the statement. Once you have this statement, you can try to add topology, and that's what uh, Kamia, Garbon, and Newman did. Use our results to uh, prove that the spin field as a, as, a, as a function, as a random function, converges in the sense of distribution to a random distribution. This follows uh, from our results. Okay, so you can prove that you have convergence and you can compute exactly this term and that term. Uh, so uh, what is that uh, universal term? 
the one point function, if you have, it depends on the domain on, on the boundary condition. So if you have plus boundary condition, plus print of the boundary, and uh, you have a simply connected domain, then at this one point function is simply given, given by um, the derivative of the unique conformal map that maps your domain to the unit disk, that maps the point at which you look at the spin to zero and that has positive derivative uh, to uh, uh, at that point to the power uh, one over x. So you take the derivative of that map at the point x to the power one over x. So this is to be expected just from this uh, conformal covariance statement. Uh, the two point function is more interesting. It was predicted by Chardis. Uh, so the two point function with plus boundary conditions, but again, we can treat general boundary conditions, uh, is given by a product of one point functions times an interaction term, which is given in terms of the hyperbolic distance of the spins uh, in your domain. So one minus the exponential of minus twice the hyperbolic distance between the points to the power one point. Okay. So for more points, formula become more complicated, but you can compute quite explicitly all uh, the correlation functions uh, with plus boundary conditions and with more general boundary conditions. And you can prove essentially all the predictions that were made in physics about these uh, spin correlations at critical temperatures. So, uh, in the full plane, there are some recent interesting results that have been developed, uh, in particular by Dubeda and Pinson in the recent years, uh, where uh, Dubeda, Dubeda proved uh, this result in the case uh, when omega is the full plane. His method is very powerful and it could work in principle for other domains as well, uh, but it's not been done yet. And uh, Pinson uh, looked at just a two-point function uh, on the full plane and with a very uh, nice and original technique, he proved uh, the, the version of this result in the case uh, where uh, you're in the full plane and you have two points. Okay. So still the bounded domains, general domain question re uh, has remained essentially completely open since. So your results are powerful too, right? Absolutely, it's, uh, it's more general, yeah. Okay. And uh, well, in the full plane, there are beautiful results of McCoy, Wood Tracy and Barrows, Satomi Wajimbo and Palmer Tracy. Uh, about the critical and near critical uh, Isaac model. More or less rigorous depending on the paper. Okay, and so uh, that's one field by which you can describe the Isaac model. Uh, the other relevant field as conjectured by conformal field theory is the energy field. You uh, try to here describe not the value of the spins at one point, but rather the contribution to the energy of a given uh, pair of adjacent spins. So pair of adjacent spins contributes to plus one or minus one to the energy. And uh, you can ask uh, how is the energy of the spin configuration distributed across the lattice. So you have results that are analogous. The power is uh, just n, minus n, not minus n over eight. And the formulas are a bit simpler. Okay, so th that was joint work of with Stas Mironov and I presented this uh, about two years and a half ago. Okay, so uh, how do you prove such a result? I just want to give a short idea of how it works. So um, there are two steps mainly. One first step is to pass something to the scaling limit to prove that some quantity for the easing model converges to some qu continuous quantity, some continuous explicit quantity. And then you have to gather all the data you obtained in the first step and uh, reformulate it to obtain uh, this result, okay. So let me first describe a bit of the first step in a special case. So what is the idea of the first step? Uh, you can compute logarithmic derivative of this uh, spin correlation. So let me just explain it in the case of one spin with plus boundary condition, because it explains most of the idea. So what do you want to do? Well, we, what we would like to compute is the following limit. The limit as the mesh size goes to zero, zero of the value of uh, the expected value of one spin uh, dividing the expected value of the spin that is just next to it on the lattice. Delta is the size of a little square. So when I write uh, x plus delta, I just mean the spin next to the spin where I'm looking at. So I want to show that this ratio as delta goes to zero, well, goes to one 
And then if I sub uh, subtract one and I divide this by the mesh size, uh, then I get a continuous explicit quantity, which I expect to be the logarithmic derivative of that quantity. Why? Well, because if you put the things in the same, uh, on the same denominator, you're just gonna get a difference, which is should converge to a derivative over the value of the spin, okay? So you expect that this converges to that the der logarithmic derivative of this. Okay, so how do you do this? How do you con connect the discrete level with the continuous level? Well, uh, you have to reveal the exact solvability property of your easing model in a special way. So the technique we are gonna use is, uh, involves lattice spinners. So lattice spinners were already studied somehow by Sato Miwajimbo in, a, in the context of spin correlation. Uh, yet their formulation is different and uh, doesn't work for bounded domains and it is not uh, fully rigorous. Okay, and it's actually more complicated. So uh, what do you want to do? Well, you construct a lattice spinner. I'm not going to give the full definition of this lattice spinner here because it would take just a bit too much time, but it's not very complicated. So it, it is a function of several points on the lattice. First, it's gonna be a function of the discretization of your domain, on your discrete domain, and of the spin at which you want to compute this quantity. So it's gonna be a function of these two, th these two piece of data, the domain and the point where you want the spin, plus of an extra point, an extra, an extra point which is left as a free parameter. So this extra point is going to be allowed to move on the lattice, on the domain, and more precisely, it's gonna be allowed to move on the double cover of your domain, ramified around the point where you want to look at the spin. So uh, you have your discrete domain, you look at its double cover, so just two copies of uh, this graph, uh, ramified around the point uh, X, and so it's a function of this point Z, which is defined as a statistic of a family of, uh, of pictures, like the pictures I'm drawing, drawing here for a point Z that I've located here. I look at pictures defined on the original graph, and I'm just gonna weigh these pictures by complex weights, okay? So it's a completely explicit definition, somehow a bit long to write, but not extremely complicated, uh, which is defined for every point Z on the double cover. For every point Z, you're going to get a different collection of pictures and you're gonna weigh uh, these pictures and, and sum the weights uh, and get this function. Okay. So what is, why is this function relevant to our problem? Because this uh, function you construct, if you evaluate it at when the point Z is just next to uh, the point X, so the point Z is allowed to move every, every, everywhere in the domain. If you evaluate this function just uh, next to X, meaning just here, what you get is that this function, well, that's an elementary consideration if you look at the definition, gives you the ratio of the value of the spin here on average divided by the value of the spin here on average, or most of the quantity you want. That's right, to, uh, the point next to x. The point next x, x plus delta over two if you wish. X plus delta is here, x is here. The spins live on the faces, okay? So uh, it goes to a point between x and x plus delta. So z is also the That's right. Z can also live on different places, but mostly, yes, it's, 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 it's defined uh, here. If you want more detail, I can show you some slides after the talk that explain exactly what this function is. But yeah, in, in the, in the function uh, No, no, it's defined uh, as a sum of pictures like that. <laughs> okay. But these lines mean like the gross interface lines or correspondence lines? They mean disorder lines, artificial disorder lines, yeah. So in, in, the, um, in the language of operators of Kadanov and Teva, this uh, function is nothing but uh, by z sigma a over sigma a, uh, except that you have to just take one component of psi. Not well, you have to, it's, it's, it's very similar to this. Okay. So, so we are mixing the mirror of the same operation. 
that part. And it size mix is a size itself uh, 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 disorder next to a spin. So yeah. So you make just a construction like that. I like to construct things in this way rather than speaking about uh, disorder operators because, uh, well, I think it's sli slightly easier to explain to someone who doesn't know disorder operators. And also, uh, if you formulate things in this way, it's easier to say see a number of symmetries that you use uh, later. <laughs> Well, of course, if I haven't given you the definition, you cannot really see the sy symmetries in the definition, but there are some symmetries. Okay, so, okay, you have formulated a quantity of interest uh, for your model in terms of the function you constructed. This works at any value of the critical temperature, and, uh, okay, it depends on the, I mean, whether it's useful or not depends on, the, uh, on how useful the function is. What is nice and interesting about this function is that uh, at critical temperature, it is the unique solution of the following discrete boundary value problem. So this is where the lattice integrability of the model uh, appears in a form that is not as classical as other forms. So, so uh, what, do you, what can you say about the function you constructed? As a function of this extra point V, which is large to me in your, in your domain, it is a discrete holomorphic function. So what does it mean? Uh, it means, roughly speaking, that the lattice version of the Cauchy Riemann equation is satisfied. Uh, so, Cauchy Riemann equations are uh, uh, differential equations relating the real part and the imaginary part as holomorphic functions. Here, you will have different equations relating uh, the real and imaginary parts of your discrete function. So, essentially, you're going to say that uh, the value of a function at one point minus the value of the function of the function at another point is equal to 1 over i times the value of the function at this point minus the value of the function at that point. Okay. So it's completely elementary. It uses the fact that you are at critical temperature, and this actually characterizes somehow the fact that you are at critical temperature. Uh, so you discrete holomorphic on this double cover. Yeah, so it's a, double yeah, so, so it's a multi-valued function. Uh, ramified over x, that change sign when you just make a loop around x. Okay. So it's discrete holomorphic everywhere except just next to x, actually. I mean, it has a failure to be discrete holomorphic. Uh, essentially, the elementary proof you use to prove this fact fails just next to x. And uh, it has, for that reason, uh, what we call a discrete singularity. Uh, the lattice cauchy riemann equations uh, just hold plus up to an, an error that doesn't vanish. So you have a discrete singularity. And finally, you have boundary conditions. Uh, what are the, these boundary conditions lo looking like? Uh, you have a condition on the argument, the complex argument of your function on the boundary of the domain. Uh, that you can formulate in this way. Uh, the imaginary part of the value of your function at the point z, which is on the boundary. So you can add extra boundary points uh, on your lattice and extend your function to these boundary points in such a way that it preserves the discrete holomorphicity. And at these boundary points, the value of the function multiplied by the square root of the normal vector of the domain, the normal vector being viewed as a complex number, like if it's like that, it's one, like that, i, etc. So uh, the value of the function times the square root of this normal vector has imaginary part zero, is in other words, is purely real. So this is a condition about the argument. It tells you what the argument of the function on the boundary is modulo pi. Yeah. So the proof of all this is combinatorial and rather uh, straightforward once you have the right definition. And uh, that's the way in which the integrability of the model is recaptured. Okay, why is it a... Uh, it's n it was, it could have been known earlier, but it, it nobody wrote it. And I guess that if it was casted as wrote, written as clearly, people would have understood that it's possible to do something. I mean, this, con this construction we do somehow is, the way we formulate it is original, but, uh, the, but very close analogs of this construction existed somehow already for a long time. Spinners were introduced by Kaufman in the 50s or late 40s, I don't know. 
And uh, well, you know, every generation just makes some slight modification, for reformulates things in a certain way. Uh, at some point, you have a rather simple formulation. <laughs> Yes, I, if you want, but it's 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 a spinner version of that. Uh, the parafermi, I mean, the par we have analogs of the parafermions. This is not the parafermion. It has monodromy. I mean, it's not the same as the parafermion of Cardio Riva. It has monodromy, but in spirit, it's very similar. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I mean, something which uh, uh, which is rather remarkable is the uniqueness, and I, I think that's something worth emphasizing. It's you know it's a way to say clearly easing model is exactly solvable in the sense that you can construct this function by solving a linear algebra problem involving a number of variables that is just proportional to the side of the system, and it will give you if you evaluate it at the right one a very uh, nice quantity. Really easy, easy to check. It's rather easy to check. Rather easy. Okay, so if you're interested in the limits, so you still have to do analysis. So uh, what, uh, what is the result? Well, once properly rescaled, this function as a function of v uh, will converge to a continuous function. Okay. So the rescaling factor is of the order of magnitude square root of the mesh size. Okay. And uh, if you renormalize uh, properly, then you converge to a function which is a continuous function that is the unique solution to the continuous analog of this problem. Continuous uh, discrete holomorphicity is of course holomorphicity. Continuous uh, singularity is gonna be just a regular singularity or one of the square root. And the boundary conditions are going to become the analog boundary, analogous boundary conditions. But how are boundary conditions there? They're not in the derivative. No, there are uh, some Riemann type boundary conditions. This can be re rewritten in terms of Riemann Hilbert problems, but I don't, or if it's really useful to, that's right. We don't really use any of the theory of Riemann-Hilbert problems. It's, it, it's, a, it's a boundary conditions which is actually uh, rather typical for fermions, even though it's never been written anywhere. I think it's rather typical uh, to fermions because it's, it beha it's like a one half form type of boundary condition. No. 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 Uh, no. And I, I don't. I, I wouldn't know how to rely on general theory for all problems. Actually, this problem is rather uh, is rather hard. Uh, if there were not some miracles, it would be essentially impossible to solve. Uh, there are some miracles because why is it would be, would it be impossible to solve uh, in general? If you w say if you were to replace the square root by anything else. It would be essentially impossible to solve on arbitrary domains. Because uh, the thing is that uh, this, uh, this boundary condition is very unstable, uh, passing to the limit. Like, because on lattice level, the normal vector can only take four directions. In the continuum, it can take the continuum of directions. And if the domain is not smooth, it does not even exist as a function. Uh, yet, uh, so there is no chance that the function converges on the boundary <laughs> to that function. There's no chance. But I, I, in the bulk, it does. It co in the bulk, this function converges to that function, that, uh, and this function extends to the, to the boundary in such a way that it satisfies the analog of this problem. But you, you, you don't have convergence on the boundary. So it's not completely trivial. The, the, I mean, so somehow, this I mean, usually what's hard to prove, I mean, what's easy to prove usually is that uh, a, disc a discrete problem converges to a continuous problem. What's hard to prove is that the solution uh, converge. Here, it's not true that the discrete problem converges to the continuous problem if you want. The solutions converge to the solutions to a continuous analog of the problem. But, it's a, 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 but the problem itself, this boundary condition does not converge to the continuous boundary condition. Yes, yes, yes. But no, it's not, surpri it's, not, it's not surprising. But it's surprising that you can still prove that you can have convergence. That's what you mean. That's what I mean. If you have convergence, yeah. the continuum proves the, what, what boundary condition? The analog, the analog of this boundary condition, yeah. 
So somehow the equation does not converge with the solution. <laughs> I mean, well. So you equate the fat rate. Yeah. Okay, so uh, first you have to prove that it converges. I don't want to enter too much the details. Uh, the idea is to rely partly on some ideas introduced by Sas Murnoff about the fact that on discrete level it is possible to integrate the square of this function and uh, transform this boundary condition into a nicer one. Okay. Uh, th 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 I mean, the proof is, is rather tricky in the sense that it requires many tricks. It's not very long. It's not extremely technical, but it requires uh, I mean, the proof of convergence of this requires about like 10 different types of tricks. So I think the difference in the language is that it's many different types. The tricks are different, completely different. Yeah. And they are not, I mean, a, a, a fair part is completely new. I mean, or, just mi mi or miraculously here because we are working in this framework. Yeah. I mean, mo most of it is miraculous. I mean, this kind of. This such a type of convergence is, is extremely hard to get in general. Uh, I mean, if you don't have miracles, it's essentially impossible. <laughs> okay, anyway, so uh, you, you prove that you converge. And now you, you look at the power series expansion of the continuous function, continuous holomorphic function you have around the mono monodromy point, so it has a singularity, one over square root minus z minus x. And if you further extend, you compute explicitly what is the unique solution to this continuous boundary value problem. You first find a holomorphic function that has the right, uh, that satisfies this, and you know it's unique, so you find just find it explicitly. And uh, if you compute the power, uh, the, the coefficient in front of the second term, you get a miracle. <laughs> uh, the logarithmic derivative of the CFP, the continuous correlation function. So now you have what remains to be done is to identify this second coefficient in the expansion with the limit of that. So uh, first, the this term should uh, correspond to the fact that your uh, spinner equals this next to the singularity, not this minus one. So you have an extra one. This extra one, when you divide by the mesh size, to the square root of the mesh size, uh, will generate a singularity. Then, uh, so if you subtract, you expect to be able to see the next order, and that's what you see. So you have to identify this coefficient uh, with uh, this one. So this, is, this is not completely trivial either, for the reason that you're evaluating this discrete spinner at just half a lattice step away from the singularity. So you have an, an interchange of limits, which is not completely obvious. You have to match what is the fine behavior of your function half a step away from the singularity, uh, and you have to relate that uh, to the power series expansion uh, of, the, of the continuous function next to its singularity. In other words, this does not converge when z is close to x to that, for the reason that you have a singularity. However, you can still uh, manage to prove that if you evaluate it next at the right point next to the singularity, and you subtract the right thing, you can see that, yeah, okay. Anyway, I, I mean, so this method is a bit more complicated for more points, but follows roughly the same philosophy. Okay. So once you're there, you have compute, you have identified what should be logarithmic derivative of the spin correlation. What do you do then? You would like to integrate them, which will give you the differences of logarithmic, of logarithmic derivatives. So the differences of logarithmic derivatives at various points are going to give you the logarithms of the ratio of the spin correlation. So I see. So you define this function as a ratio. Yeah. And then there's this uh, question. So somehow this uh, second term in the continuum expansion. Yes. I, I, is the object you want, wha, 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 yeah. And uh, for some reason, nobody had noticed that either, that the CFT core, I mean, you know, even from a rigorous, uh, unrigorous pr perspective, <coughs> people could have constructed the uh, continuous versions of this yes. and look at the second or term in the expansion and see that they give the spin, the CFT core, the CFT uh, spin correlations. It, ha it has not been obvious. Uh, yeah. Sato Miwajimbo, might have known about that, but it's not been observed. Uh, I, I, I mean, you know. So, so on the left hand side, you can see the nice part of the evaluation. Oh, yeah. And a, as a result of understanding this nice part, you get the, you get what you want from the spin. Is that, is that what's going on? Uh, I'm just trying to understand the order. 
Okay, so the philosophy is that you construct a function lattice level because of lattice integrability, it satisfies condition. This function, if you evaluate it at a, a point you like, gives you the value you want. Elsewhere, it gives you something else. Now, uh, how do you uh, well? Uh, how do you understand the scaling limit of the value of this function? Well, intuitively, it should be possible to read it in the power series expansion, and it's possible. Yeah. Okay, so you you have this logarithmic derivative, so you integrate them. Basically, you can compute the ratio of spins here and spins there. Now you can compute the ratio of this spin over that spin, and you can just integrate ratios of a line and compute uh, and integrate them and get the ratios of spin correlation. So uh, now it still remains to prove a bit more. You would like to prove that not the ratios, but the functions themselves can break. Okay. So somehow, uh, you know, there are many things that disappear if you if you forget if you just take ratios. For instance, this normalization you don't see, and uh, yeah. Okay. Still, uh, the formulas here you can also already read them at the level of ratios. So, uh, okay, you integrate a logarithmic derivative. Uh, one point function is easy to integrate. More point functions is a bit harder to integrate than this. Explicit formulas, yeah, not particularly nice, but it can be integrated. So you have the, the ratios of spin correlations at various, at various locations, and then you want to ca calibrate them. You want to say, uh, obtain results that will make them independent, I mean, would make the normalization you choose independent of the choice of the domain. At this point, you're able to compute ratios of correlations of various points at various locations in a given domain. Now you would like to make the results domain independent. So uh, how do you do this? The easiest correlations to cal calibrate are the two spin correlations. Uh, why? Well, because uh, you would like to, you need a reference, basically to compute all these things, you need just one reference point. If you know how to compute ratios, you just need to be able to compute at one given point. So what is the reference you take for two spin correlation? Uh, the idea is basically that you want to bring two points really close to each other. And if two points are really close to each other, you'd expect that they don't see anymore the shape of the domain. And that they are the same as, uh, say, in the full plane, okay? So, uh, well, to prove this rigorously, you need to do some more discrete complex analysis involving uh, slightly different uh, spinners, but rather related and uh, some uh, inequalities, uh, like duality, et cetera. But basically, uh, you manage to relate the local behavior to local behavior of spin correlations in whatever direction you wish in the full plane. So you can just choose a direction in which you have particularly nice formula. So it's a result of Wu, but now we have a new proof also using discrete complex analysis that if spins are on the same diagonal in the full plane, you have an ex at critical temperature, you have a completely explicit finite distance formula whose scaling limit is as nice as oh, you want. So you don't want the yeah, so you, you basi basically because you compute any ratio, you can calibrate by choosing just the direction you want. So that, 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 that's essentially the exponent. Uh, that's part of the exponent. Uh, that's where this guy comes from. Uh, the, the power one over eight, you already see it with the take ratios of spin correlation. So you see the one over eight in two different ways. And somehow if you had not this result, you could still say, okay, once we normalize properly by something, by the scaling limit of the two point, func by two point function, uh, you converge to something. But, and you wouldn't, but you wouldn't be able to identify the power after. Uh, up to log factor, yes. You could. You could. Up to log, log factor, you could. Uh, but, uh, but yes, up to dog factor, yes. Uh, no, but the, 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 the reason being that really you have a one over eight that is all already all, all, all around. Uh, like just think scaling limit in the full plane, in the half plane, in the half plane. In the half plane, uh, ratios of uh, spin correlations at various distances, you can compute them in the scaling limit. So you need to make a small interchange of limit to say that it's the same as computing uh, at finite distance. But you know, you can already compute in the half plane ratios of correlation functions uh, at finite distance. So you, you, you can get up to log factor to the one over eight. Yeah. Well, okay. So uh, the two point function, it's calibrated. Once you have calibrated it, you can calibrate the one point function, which is somehow harder to calibrate because you cannot use the full plane. Because you know, the full plane is zero. So the one, one spin correlation, how do you calibrate it? Uh, the idea is that two spin correlation in a bounded domain, if one of the points moves close to the boundary, 
the spins will tend to de decorrelate. And we'll tend to factor as a product of two one-point functions, and you can compute the ratios of one-point functions. So you can decorrelate uh, uh, the two-point function and get them a product of one-point functions, which calibrates the one-point function. <coughs> and once you have the one-point functions, you can start an induction uh, with a to calibrate the point, the, the endpoint functions and n plus one point functions, etc. So this uh, is rather is th this part is tricky because I mean you you you, you need to to use what all the things you have, and it so happens that you have all you need. But uh, decorrelation is not easy to prove in the scaling limit. Uh, it so happens that because of THF inequality and some co for some a priori results we can get uh, using discrete complex analysis, we can just compute what we want. But it's rather miraculous. And this part is easy from a discrete point of view. From a continuous point of view, uh, you need to make sure that the exact formula you have that become uh, bigger and bigger as the number of points uh, gets large, uh, can be calibrated together. You have to calibrate the discrete, but at the same time, you have to calibrate the continuous. So you have to handle a bit of this. OK, so that's essentially all I want to say about these uh, spin correlations. So I hope the strategy is more or less clear. You formulate on lattice level, you construct on lattice level some quantity, uh, so some function, su such that when you evaluate it at the right point, it gives you some information. You prove that the function you construct is solution to a boundary value problem on discrete level. That uses the integrability of the model. This uh, solution to boundary value problem, you prove it converges to a continuous solution to boundary value problem. You uh, look at the expansion of the solution to continuous boundary value problem. You relate it to the value you want. You obtain the limit of the quantity you want. And then you integrate, you, int you gather together all the data you have using probabilistic techniques mo mostly to calibrate the result and uh, relating it to a diagonal spin-spin correlation in the focus. Okay. okay, so now I want to speak about the other approach, this uh, SLE approach. So the approach where you try to describe curves. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, I think it's simpler than the most of the approaches. No, but yeah, I mean, so what is the analysis of the boundary value problem? Ah, does it simplify? Yes. So if you, if you only look at the solution. Yeah, it, it, yeah the calculation, I mean, it simplifies at the level of calculation, uh, the continuous calculation. You know, the boundary value problem solutions are going to be like but super. What about the, the IFC solutions? Is that easier to do so? Is yes, it is. Yes. So, any other questions? Okay, so I just want to speak a bit about curves and the model. Because that's uh, something that uh, people have been interested in uh, in the recent years, and it's a beautiful approach as well. So, uh, what are you trying to do? You try to find natural curves that arise in the model. What are the natural curves that arise in the model? The interfaces. Okay, that these are probably the most natural curves. Uh, so what are interfaces? So if you look at the Nising model spin configuration, if you have plus spins, minus spins, you have islands of plus spins inside of the islands of plus spins, you have minus spins, etc. If you trace the boundary of these islands, you get curves, random curves. You would like to show that in the scaling limit, at critical temperature, these random curves converge to continuous random curves. Okay. So um, let's see uh, the simplest way to get continuous random curves. Well, if you consider a Nising model on a domain, like that, and uh, consider mixed boundary conditions, plus boundary conditions on one arc, minus boundary conditions on another arc. Well, you can see that these boundary conditions spontaneously generate an interface that will go uh, from uh, the point where you cha change the boundary condition to the other point. You have a curve like so that has minus spins on its left, plus spins on its right. It's an interface, okay? So you would like to say, okay, this curve converges to something. What does it converge to? A uh, schramm levner evolution process. Just want to explain briefly what is it. So uh, what are SL, uh, SLEs? SLEs uh, are uh, basically a special type of Levner chain. What is a Levner chain? A Levner chain is a way to describe a curve that grows in a domain by a real valued process. Okay. Suppose you have a curve that grows in a domain. So uh, how are you going to describe it? by real valued process. Uh, well, having in mind that you would like to have some conformal invariant. Uh, so Levner chains, uh, to, to, to understand this, you're going to map con your domain conformally 
to the upper half ring, map the source of the curve to zero, map the target of the pool curve to infinity. So now you have a curve, let's call it gamma t, that grows in the upper half ring. How are you going to describe it? You're first gonna, uh, going to describe it by its uh, shrinking complementary. The growing curve, gamma t, can be described by its shrinking complementary. You look at the half plane slitted by the curve uh, from time zero to time t, by the, tra the trace of the curve from time zero to time t. So you have a family of shrinking domains. How do you describe this family of shrinking domains? Uh, you're going to describe them by the conformal mappings that send these shrinking domains to the original upper half ring. So uh, for any time t, you have a conformal mapping that sends the slitted the ha half plane, the half plane slitted by the curve up to time t, to the full half plane. And uh, you can find a unique time normalization and conformal map normalization such that you have this normalization. Okay. So uh, at this point, what you'd look at, you look at the tip of the curve at FT, you look at where it gets, ma it gets mapped to when applying the map GT, this map that sends the slitted domain, half plane to the half plane. Well, since the map sends the boundary to the boundary, this gets mapped to the boundary of the half plane, so to a real value, uh, to a real point, <coughs> point in the real axis. So it gives you a U sub T. So uh, the claim is that this u, u sub t, this real value process, which evolves in time as the curve grows, uh, describes completely the curve. And this follows from Loewner's theorem, which says that the, conform the conformal map flows you constructed satisfy this equation, the flow equation, d sub t, d sub t of z is equal to 2 over z sub t z minus u sub t. Okay. Time zero, you have identity, you have no curve. After, after some time, sometimes you have other curves uh, or other uh, conformal maps and they satisfy this flow equation in time, which is an ODE for z space involving u sub t. So from the u sub t, you can integrate this ODE, recover the d sub t, recover the domain, recover the curve. So there's a one one correspondence between curves and real valued processes living uh, here. Okay? So SLE kappa, family of SLEs, uh, introduced by Schramm, is a uh, the Loewner chain you get uh, when the u sub t you choose is a multiple of a standard Brownian motion. So this process has co in a built-in conformal invariance for the reason that you constructed, it, you constructed it in general domains by a conformal image of uh, SLE in the half ring. So which it's a, by definition a conformally invariant process. And so as a consequence, uh, it's easy to guess at this stage that it should be the limit of any reasonably nice uh, conformally invariant curve, such as the one arising in easing models. Okay, it's a theorem of Schramm. Okay, so uh, indeed, easing interfaces converge to SLE three. So in the case I described first, this is a result of Mianov, Tarkak, and others. Uh, you have a variance of these results, and it now essentially for any type of reasonable type of boundary conditions involving plus, minus, and free boundary conditions can be proven that the interface converges to continuous interfaces. Okay? So what's... Uh, yeah, okay, you can prove that they converge to two interfaces. <laughs> ah, you can, okay, you can describe... How, how do you describe them? Yeah. Uh, you can describe one at a time. Forget about the whole, forget about the other curve. And describe the measure of one, and describe the joint measure. Yeah, I mean, all these curves are absolutely continuous with respect to SLEs like this. You can uh, write explicitly what are the radon nicodym derivatives. Yeah. But there is some, there is some, they're not independent. No, you, no, you, you can do it one at a time, you can do it two at a time. Well, yeah, you ba basically, you will describe uh, each of the curves that are rising here uh, in terms of its radon nicodym derivative with respect to a curve like this. No, actually here it is. Here it is. Huh? No, it is. It is. It is not more complicated. Because if you know the existence of a curve, 
all you know about the model is just that it has uh, say minus spins here. So it becomes like just a no simple domain. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, how you prove convergence? That's how you prove this result. Uh, basically, two steps. One is uh, pre-compactness. You make sure that your curves are not too crazy. So what does it mean? Uh, you forbid the existence of certain events. You say that the curves, as the mesh size goes to zero, you have an a priori control on their qualitative behavior. You know that they say, hold their continuous. And for that, you prove that certain events happen, occur with probability that tend to zero as the mesh size goes to zero. And uh, so we, using discrete complex analysis technique, we uh, found a certain number of such results. And plugging in, plugging in this, uh, probability bounds for certain events into a uh, general technique, such, such as the ones of Eisenman, Burkhardt, or more recent game by Smirnov, you can uh, make sure that at least uh, your curves will be curves in the limit. They will not be strange blobs or uh, weird sets. Okay. So now you have a curve in the limit. You don't know what it is. You would like to show that it is SLE3. How you do this? Well, you have your curve, you, you encode it by a love node chain. You can encode any curve by a love node chain. You have a correspondence. Once your curve is nice enough, you can encode it by a love node chain. Now you want to show that the guy you found has the law of square root of three, Hampton Brownian motion. So that, that would show that uh, your curve is SLE. So uh, you use a stochastic analysis theorem which says that this is true if uh, the bo both of these quantities are martingales. So what is a martingale? So the quantity, it's a random process uh, whose uh, future on average knowing the present is equal to the value of the present. In other words, it's, it's neither bigger nor smaller. It's a fair game if you wish. Uh, uh, I like to think of it as a stochastically conserved quantity. A quantity which does not stay constant, but on average, given any value at any time, on average, uh, will, will be the same as the present. So it's a stochastic analog of a conservation law. Why is it, why, why is it nice to think of it this way? Because after all, what you want to show is that your curve is temporally invariant. You want to show some kind of symmetry. And uh, so it, it's nice to think that if you can find conservation laws, you can identify symmetry. So uh, what is the key to do this? Well, uh, the key is to find an explicit, uh, what we call observable, or even though it's not a quantum mechanical observable, uh, find an explicit function of uh, domains endpoints that uh, will track the behavior of your curve that grows in your domain. And so basically what you want is you want to, fi you want to find a function such that if you fit it with the domain that is dynamically slitted by the growing interface of easing model and you evaluate it at the tip of the curve plus at an extra point, which is an extra parameter, a bit like before. So I you want to show that you can find an explicit function such that this is a martingale as the time evolves for any fixed key. Okay. So once you have this, essentially you can plug in uh, your explicit formula into the Lovna equation with it and deduce by differentiating with respect to the parameter or other techniques that uh, these two guys because of the explicit formula you found are marking it. Now how do you prove that uh, you find this explicit conserved quantity, this explicit family, one parameter family of marking it? Well uh, you have to use the fact that you work with this, uh, you have to use the definition of the model. So uh, th this is the usually harder part. So what you do is you find on lattice level a discrete analog of this. That's not particularly difficult to find. Uh, basically any quantity of the form, the change that uh, an interface does something, knowing what I the initial part of the interface, will behave like a martingale uh, for the reason that the future will give you info extra information uh, but on average, the, the average over all the possible futures of the information you have is essentially by construction uh, the information you have now. The average of the information in the future uh, viewed from now should be the information I have now. Okay, so and you, sh you should find such a quantity on lattice level and show that it has an explicit 
can form a least covariance scaling limit. So if you want, you can think, uh, well, what should be this quantity? For instance, uh, the value of expected value of one spin, knowing the interest rate. That would be a quantity. And actually, it's not the way we wrote it in the paper, but that would work. That would be a, a proof, natural proof. Okay, so uh, that's essentially what you do in all the cases. The difficulties are to find the right quantities that can be proven to converge for the right frameworks, for the right boundary conditions. Now, uh, just to, to, to go a bit fast, uh, once you have uh, identified interfaces going from one given point to another given point, you might want to look at more general objects, such that interfaces growing uh, from uh, points that are not necessarily generated by boundary conditions. Okay. So that's uh, recent work in progress with uh, uh, Stéphane Benoit and Hugo Dimitri Copin. Uh, basically, uh, the most natural case to start trying do to do this thing are the free boundary conditions. You, if you have free boundary conditions, I mean, ne neither plus nor minus, you let the boundary spins completely free. You can try to look at interfaces that you uh, may want to gr grow from one given point to another. So basically, uh, you have to push a bit your interface when it's on the boundary, and it, if, if it doesn't see uh, something that pushes it inside, you have to push it. Uh, so you push it when it hits the boundary, and uh, you, you uh, can prove that it converges to an explicit variance of eta uh, The idea is that whenever it's away from the boundary, it's like a regular thing, and it doesn't see that you pushed it. And whenever you push it, you just prove that it will bounce fast enough and it will not spend too much time being pushed on the boundary. So you, ha you, you, you combine Hölder estimates with uh, estimation of the, the dimensions of the time uh, where you have problems and uh, miraculously things work well and uh, you can identify uniquely uh, such interfaces. So this proves uh, some conjectures uh, and also uh, and also uh, hopefully will allow us to identify what's called the full scaling limits, the limits of all the possible interfaces that arise simultaneously in an easy model configuration. So, yeah, okay, so how much time do I have left? Uh, Minus? Yeah. yeah, okay, so. Uh,